Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. We about a minute or so late. We're having some difficulties, technical difficulties. It's like we had a uh, low signal, but uh, looks like we're good to go now. Amen. Glory to God. God is good. Hallelujah. Giving glory to God. Oh, I got to look at these things sideways. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. Hopefully everyone can see us okay. Uh, this phone is being a little weird, but I pray that you can hear us, see us, and just work with us. Every day is an adventure. Anyhow, so good to see everyone that is tuning in. Let's see, I think I saw Minister Key, I see Sister Vonda, Mother Sarah, amen, Sister Robin, Glory to God. So good to see all of you. We're going to jump right into this thing after we pray. Thank God for his goodness and his mercy for being in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead just trying to give another 45 seconds or so for people to just join us. To come on in. Amen. Glory to God. We pray that you all are blessed. Oh, I'm sideways. That's what she showed me. I'm, okay, let's see what we can do here. Amen. Come on, I need some help. Amen. Glory to God. Somebody should have commented and told me I was sideways. Amen. Let me see, is, is it, is it, is it, what's it look like now, Sister Lisa? Look at the screen for me, please. Glory to God. We do apologize for these uh, difficulties. Hopefully we'll get everything situated. Glory to God. Amen. Bear with us. Hallelujah. Okay. We apologize for any angle issues. And I pray that you still be blessed. But nonetheless, God is good and we're going to teach the word of God. Amen. Glory to God. Let us pray. If you want to get us, look at me and get me situated, you can. Okay. I, don't, I can't, I mean, how's it look? I'm having my, okay, my assistant has is helping me out here. Come on, we, 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 let's pray. Let's pray. Let the Lord have his way. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor and praise. We thank you for all of those that uh, are joining us and have joined us here tonight. Let your perfect will be done in this place. We give you today, God, glory and honor. Uh, let your word go forth in this house tonight. As we praise you, we're praying for all of those that have been sick, shut in, and we just give you, God, all the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Hallelujah. Have your way tonight, O oh God, that your word go forth as you desire for it to, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're in Joshua chapter 6. We should get down into the nitty-gritty Tonight and then uh, I think next week we should be wrapping it up uh, and then we'll get into seven. I know it's taken some time. Uh, once we get through these next probably two chapters, you'll see some speed move along and us get through the book of Joshua. Not that we're rushing, but uh, like I said, this chapter six is very interesting and has uh, apocalyptic implications. Uh, so anyway, let's get into the word of God. Now, 
Uh, I want to start, see if I can find the scripture here. Before I get back into talking about the trumpets that we were dealing with last week and then moving on from there, uh, I, I want to just insert here, and this is a bonus, uh, remember that the book of Joshua itself, there are lots of things, lots of subtopics, things of that nature. But the overall thing with the book of Joshua is possession. Uh, and I want to be very clear that uh, Though that is the case, that is possession, I don't want anyone to get confused or to uh, misunderstand me when we talk about possession. We are not necessarily talking about possessing materialistic things. We are talking about, uh, as I spoke a week or two ago in Gen about Genesis, we were created uh, in the image of God. He created us with dominion. He created us with power with might to have a dominion and that dominion is not just uh, to rule on our jobs but it is that the glory of God might shine forth in our lives that we might be a witness the Bible says in Matthew 5 and 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven uh, so people uh, see the power of God through the people of God so I want to go on to Luke 21 in 18, when you look at the book of Luke, chapter 21, uh, it's dealing with end times, just like the book of Matthew, chapter number 24, is dealing with end times as well. And so when you look at that, uh, what, you, what you understand is he's taking them through the things that are going to happen. Uh, and as he's doing that, he talks about these things, these tribulations that are going to come upon uh, the earth and and uh, things that will even happen to the people of God. But he says there, in dealing with possession, he says, But there shall not an hair of your head perish in your patience, possess ye your soul. So I want to talk about when we're dealing with possession, he's talking about possessing your soul. What is the soul? Uh, in essence, the mind, the will, and the emotions. And the, the thing that gets people uh, is, is the, look, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that he has not given us a spirit of fear, that 2 Timothy 1 and 7, uh, but of love, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So uh, your, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So with patience. In other words, when we're going through all of these things, what are you going to do? You're going to possess your soul. You're going to own your soul. You're going to have dominion over your soul. Your soul is going to belong to it belongs to God. But as far as you bring it unto into subjection, you don't let your we don't let our emotions uh, get the best of us uh, when it comes to that. But rather. What we do is we possess our soul. We own it. Another scripture when it deals with possession uh, is 1 Thessalonians 4 and 4. That says, every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Sanctification meaning separation. So you should know how to possess. So what are we possessing? Ultimately, we're possessing the flesh. Ultimately, we're possessing our minds. Ultimately, uh, what do you mean? Why is that so important? Because especially, I don't want to say as the end times approach, because the end times are here, not in, 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 in the essence of everything is happening at once, but we're progressively moving more and more into end times. And as that happens, you, we need to understand the only way we're going to make it is if our souls are possessed. The Bible says, and I may be dealing with this some on Sunday, but in, in, in uh, Romans uh, 12 and 1, it talks about uh, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. You cannot do that if you don't possess your body. What does that mean? I possess my mouth. I can tell my mouth and my mind to shut up. I know we were taught not to say that. I know I was growing up, but sometimes we got to be firm with our mouths. Sometimes we have to be firm with our minds and our 
thinking, amen, glory to God, so that uh, we're letting our, our, our soul know that God is in charge uh, of possessing us. So I want you to understand that that is very, very important uh, as we deal with possession, to possess your souls with patient possession your soul. And then it says that we ought to know that we possess our souls, uh, understanding that we got to be sanctified. Amen. Uh, how that, that we should know how to possess our vessel rather in sanctification and in honor. Now, as we continue to uh, deal with uh, the, these trumpets here, I just want to deal a little bit more with that uh, because this is obviously uh, very much prevalent in the book of Joshua, especially in chapter number six. Now, the Bible says that. Uh, in Amos 3 and 6, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? Now, to be clear, and I know I said this before a week or two ago, that this particular trumpet, the shofar, the ram's horn, uh, had two or three notes. Uh, it was not for music. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, for big band play. It wasn't to jazz it up. But it was um, for an alarm. It was for a signal. It was a trumpet that was for battle. Uh, it was used for religious purposes. It was used uh, in war as well. So I said that to say that uh, the sound of the trumpet is not for music. Uh, it is not necessarily to make us feel good. It is an alarm. Uh, so it's not a mistake that the that the that the Bible compares uh, the voice of even the preacher uh, to a trumpet. He says in Isaiah 58 and 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Now, I would be willing to bet that those of you that use alarm clocks to wake up in the morning, your alarm clock and some people, you know, they have the radio and they use music to wake them up or whatever the case may be. But I doubt that your alarm clock has the sound that says, Hallelujah. Why is that? Because that alarm, that's not an alarm. That's a soothing sound. That's a sound that's going to make you feel good and that's going to lull you into sleep. But rather, most people's alarms are annoying. I remember that I was, uh, I think we were at a, uh, a function, this was a while ago, it was at work, and we had probably one of those holiday um, breakfasts or meals, and my text message, my work, uh, I have two different sounds. I have a regular text message for my regular text messages, uh, and then I have uh, for those alerts uh, that, that's, that, that, that uh, if somebody's out there doing something potentially that they're not supposed to be doing, uh, for those that are assigned to my GPS cases, uh, I have a, an alarm sound. And one went off during the, uh, the function, and then the other one went off, and then there were people that were complaining. Um, and they said, uh, uh, praise the Lord, Pastor Arnold, so good to uh, see you. Uh, so, but anyway, they said, uh, you need to change that. I said, why? They said, because that's annoying. That's the point, because I need to answer that. I need to know that that's heard. So what I'm saying is the trumpet blowing is sometimes going to seem annoying. It's going to sometimes seem like it gets us. Why? Because when there's a fire, you don't hear someone saying, fire, fire, there's a fire. No, fire, get out of the house. Amen. It's an alarm. So sometimes our flesh will not seem like it's not going to not sometimes, but all the time. The flesh is not going to necessarily connect with the preacher. Sometimes flesh, flesh will get upset. And that's why the Bible talks about in the last days. They'll, that they will be pre that they will have itching ears. They're going to want to have preachers that will tickle them and make them feel good. Another scripture for that is found in Ezekiel uh, chapter number 33, verse 32, where it says, And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. 
for they hear thy words, but they do them not. So it is important for us to remember in this last days. Yes, I understand uh, that we don't go that, that we have to use wisdom. The Bible says that uh, that a soul winner is wise. Uh, he that wins souls rather is wise. And we understand that. But listen, we must understand that all of us, whether we are pulpit ministers or however that may be, we are ministers of the gospel. And as the last days come, we must sound an alarm. And that's what the trumpet is. This is not a gospel that's going to make people feel good. This is a gospel that that gets people ready. John the Baptist, prepare ye the way, make straight the path, get ready for the coming of the Lord. Uh, Jesus, they, they went present, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's what the trumpet does. It sounds an alarm and it gives a signal. Glory to your name, Jesus. Now, as we move forward, um, here the Bible goes on to say, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Some people don't want to hear the trumpet. When it says entreated, it means rejected. It means refused. People will refuse. People will not want to hear. Zechariah 9 and 14 says, And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. Still dealing with the trumpet. In Matthew 24 and 31, the Bible says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Here we go. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That's another signal. That's another sign that when that trumpet, we know we're going to read the scripture here in a moment, that when that trumpet sounds, that's when we uh, get excited, when we see the signs leading up to the last trump. Amen. Glory to God. The Bible says in, in Revelation 8 and 2, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, just like here that seven priests in Joshua 6 and 4, seven priests had, had, had seven trumpets of ram horn, and on the seventh day they went about the city seven times, and they would blow with those trumpets. Similar to this Revelation 8 and 2, or rather Revelation yeah, 8 and 2, and then Revelation 8 and 6 is, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, types and shadows, types and shadows, their shout, when you look at Joshua chapter number six, what were they doing? They had trumpets and they were shouting. OK, this is a type of what is going to happen in the end time. Even the Bible tells us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of man. I keep telling uh, uh, you all that Romans chapter 15 talks about that the scriptures were written aforetime uh, for our learning that we through patience and compass of the, of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, so the Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And what's going to happen when he does that? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. And here in Revelation 11 and 15. The Bible says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Why do I continue to talk about this trumpet and this sound as it relates to Joshua chapter number six? It is preparing us for what happens on that seventh day when they walk around seventh time and when they blow the seven trumpets horns, the seven priests, when they do that, and when they shout with the shout, it is letting us know that there is ultimate victory in Christ. No matter what we deal with, no matter what we go through, when that trumpet sounds, uh, when, when God says it's time, there is ultimate victory. I wish somebody could get with me in the house today. Amen. So now, and here we go. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 51, 52, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed. Who is the we? Those of us that are in Christ, those of us that believe, those of us that have accepted salvation and gone through those steps, those of us that have repented, that have been baptized in Jesus' name, that have been filled with his spirit. Uh, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. When? In a moment. It's going to happen quick. In the twinkling of an eye. But when? At the last trump. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's why when we deal with this last trump here, there are things that will take place before the last trump sound. But we have to be ready. Amen. And it's just not good enough for us just to say, well, I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, we're going to be gone and all this other type of stuff. We must understand what is going on in the end time. We must be ready. Uh, to meet the Lord when he comes uh, to meet us, when we are caught up in the air to meet him. So the Bible says that when the last trump comes, we're not getting out of here until that last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. Now, uh, let's go back to Joshua 6 and 5. It says, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Understand that uh, when you look at this and when the wall falls down flat, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not talking about falling over. It's talking about literally just falling down. Uh, and it, 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 many that have studied history, not just Bible, but history in conjunction with the Bible have confirmed uh, archaeologists and historians have confirmed that uh, the spot where they believe the walls to be, there is evidence that it didn't fall over this way or fall over that way, that it literally just, boom, it's like it just came uh, down, uh, just came straight down. Uh, and then once this happened, then the people went over uh, into the city and took over. So it says that, so the people, uh, so uh, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So once the shout is over, they were to go up. They were to go up before them after they shouted, after they did that portion. Now, the Bible goes on to say in Joshua 6 and 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Now, I want you to understand something. And we get into some of this next week also. But I want you to understand that uh, that before they could take the city. The wall had to come down and fall down flat. That's why we spent so much time on the trumpet, because the wall did not come down until the trumpet sounded, until they went around seven times, signifying that God's perfect completion, uh, signifying also that man was supposed to rest on the seventh day. If man was supposed to rest, that means that God is the one that is doing the work. He is the one that allows the wall to come down. But once the wall comes down, down there is still a job to be done that's why eight the number eight signifies new beginning that's why I remember before we got into all of this we talked about circumcision uh, that when they came up uh, uh, and, and crossed over coming up into Jordan uh, uh, over Jordan rather that what happened they were circumcised um, typically circumcision that was the cutting off of the flesh uh, you were supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day after you were born eight signifying new beginning so once the walls come down after that seventh day and we go in now this is a new beginning this is uncharted territory this is the lord having his way it says in the bible and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city both man and woman young and old and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword but Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swear unto her. And the young men 
that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron. They put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the heart of the lie and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwells in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers. We'll deal some with that next week which Joshua said to spy out Jericho. Now, I want to talk about these priests. This is the next, this is the next significant thing. We've dealt with trumpets. Uh, we're dealing with the wall falling down. But now let's deal with priests. The Bible, the Hebrew word for priest here is Kohen. Uh, Kohen. It means one officiating or chief ruler. Uh, one who is authorized to minister in sacred things. Uh, particularly to offer sacrifices at the altar and to act as a mediator between God and man. Okay. The office of priesthood in Israel was of utmost importance and of high rank. And it was through the priestly functions that the people of God were brought in close relations. May I cover some of this last week with God and kept therein. Now, through the ministerial functions of the priesthood, the people of God were instructed in the doctrine of sin and its atonement. So here we see the importance of the priesthood. OK. Uh, and then when you, you're dealing with the Levites, you're dealing with the priesthoods, you did the Kohathites was the group that was responsible um, for the carrying and the bearing of the ark. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So. Uh, understand that. So now it was through the ministerial function of the priests of the people of God were instructed in the doctrine of sin and atonement. I want to read here now in 2 Timothy 3 and 16. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. I'm sorry, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is letting us know the importance of the priesthood, the importance of ministry. OK, uh, uh, the priest's office was very involved in service and ministration in the tabernacle and in regards to the sacred things of God. The Kohathites have been mentioned specifically for being responsible for bearing the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we find this in Deuteronomy 31 and 9. Other scriptures uh, use the more broad term of priests or Levites. Amen. Glory to God. Excuse me. Uh, or both. And this can be found in Joshua 3 and 3, Joshua 3 and 6, Deuteronomy 31 and 25, as well as 1 Kings 8 and 3 through 6, uh, and 1 Chronicles 15 and 14. Now, priests blowing, before, blowing trumpet before the ark is also seen in 1 Chronicles 15 and 24 and 1 Chronicles 16 and 6. Now, I want to talk to you about the nature of the priest's office. The nature of the priest's office implies divine choice. Numbers 3 and 12, the English Standard Version. Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine. Okay, Numbers 3 and 41 through 42, again, English Standard Version. It says, and you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord, instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites, instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the people of Israel. So Moses listed all the firstborn among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded him. Glory to God. Now, originally, God had required the firstborn. And the reason that God required the firstborn was as a sign that he had saved the firstborn of the Israelites because they put the blood of the lamb uh, on their doorpost. Amen. So that the death angel would not pass or rather so that the death angel would pass over them and would not destroy the firstborn. OK, so since that was the case. Uh, they, the, all the firstborn belonged to God, a, a, a sort of a tithe, you could say. But what happened was there was an instant uh, dealing with the golden calf where Moses was asking, who's going to stand with me? 
and who's going to go with every man up against his brother, every man against his neighbor. And the Levites stood, the tribe of Levi stood with Moses. And so it is believed and it is most likely that the reason the tribe of Levi was set apart to minister in the priestly services was because they were the only tribe that stood with Moses against the people uh, when they worshiped the golden calf. This can be found in Exodus 32 and 25 through 29. Exodus 32 and 25 through 29. So again, the priest's office implies divine choice. This means that the person that is chose to minister in the sacred things of God. When we compare Old Testament priest, priesthood, so to speak, to New Testament, not getting into Christ yet, but to New Testament priesthood as it is man's office, you're simply talking about ministering in the sacred things of God. Uh, one of the sacred things of God is the temple of the living God. Uh, uh, who's the temple of the living God? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, uh, paraphrasing here, as well as in 1 Corinthians 6.19, that know ye not that our body is the temple of the living God. Because uh, we, so, so when we deal with the temple, when we deal with the tabernacle, we understand we are that living temple of God. He dwells in us. He dwells in a house that was not made with hands. It wasn't made with hands. It was made what? By, it was made by what? The breath of God. As Genesis 2 and 7 tells us that he breathed into man the breath of life. And that is when man became a living soul. Is anybody talking back to me in the house today? Glory to God. So now, um, so here we have divine choice. Uh, that's very, very important. It is God's choosing. And the Bible says that, especially when we deal with end times, that he's made us to be priests and kings. But I don't believe that that's just for millennial reign. He, what, what does a priest do? A priest stands in the gap. And we'll get into some of this in a minute. A priest intercedes. A priest represents the people. Uh, uh, there's a scripture that says, uh, I, I, I sought for a man, amen, to stand in the gap, amen, to make up the hedge uh, and to stand in the gap for the people. And I found none. He's looking for a people in this hour for the people of God to stand in the gap. And that's why when we talk about on Sunday, let us go on unto perfection. If I'm still dealing with struggling uh, with, with the base things of God, if I'm still struggling with baptisms and doctrines and arguing over foolish things like that, and I've been saved for 10, 15 years, how can I possibly be a priest in my community? And sometimes I think we wait to get our pie, our piece of uh, pie in the by and by when we're flying up in the sky. I wish I could get some amens up in here. Glory to God. But that's not necessarily, he is wanting us here and now, he, he said um, in the Old Testament, he talks about them. I will make you a kingdom of priests. I will make you a nation of priests. Uh, so it is the will of God. We cannot look just for pulpit ministry. We must look to continue to go on. And that's why the priests, there was the seven priests here in Joshua that were so very heavily involved with blowing the trumpet. They were involved with sounding that signal. And that is for you and I today to sound the signal. If we are to be a kingdom of priests, if we are to be a nation of priests, then we must do priestly things and minister in ministerial function. What was one of the things that the ministers did? Amen. Glory to God. As I spoke earlier, they were, uh, uh, they were essential, amen, to instruct people in the doctrine of sin and in the atonement of sin, to not only let them know when sin was there, but to let them know, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. Glory to God. And that is what is the will of God for even us in this hour today. So divine choice. It also implies priesthood also implies representation. Hebrews 5 and 1 says every high priest. Uh, this is the New International Version. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. Priesthood implies representation. So the people, the priests that were blowing on the trumpets, they were representing the people. Amen. Uh, the other thing uh, that, that priesthood implies is offering sacrifice. 
You can see the above verse uh, of Hebrews 5 and 1 that, that they were uh, a representation appointed by God to represent the people in matters relating to God uh, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. Offer gifts, offer sacrifices. Uh, Hebrews 7 and 26 uh, through 27 says, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Uh, so our high priest offered up the ultimate sacrifice. As the Bible says, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And we know that that lamb was Jesus Christ. The other thing that the priest does, and this is important, in Leviticus 5 and 6, it, the, 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 the priest is an intercessor. The priest, uh, priesthood implies intercession. The Bible says, uh, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned. A female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Uh, Leviticus 5 and 10 says, and he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner, and the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he has sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. Now, the priests of Israel, Israel were shadows and types. Very, uh, 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 couldn't even compare, uh, but shadows and types of the one true great high priest of God that we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4 and 14 says, Seeing then, that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. So we see here now, and we're going to move on to some other things, but we see here now that the priesthood uh, is extremely uh, important. Uh, you cannot do away with priesthood. And I want to say that because we're living in an hour now where everybody's a minister. Where everybody, and when I say minister, yes, we are certainly all ministers. Um, but there is a leader. There are supposed to be leaders. There are supposed to be people who stand in the gap. There are supposed to be people who intercede. And so when we talk about intercession, you all, we all, to each and every one of us, ought to be priests in our homes to those who are not saved. We ought to be priests in our communities. We ought to be priests on our jobs. And we ought to be sounding the alarm. What did the priests do here in the book, book of Joshua in chapter number six? They sounded the alarm. Alarm. They blew the trumpet. They shouted with a great shout. Uh, we ought not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, now, so now as, as, as we move on here, let us not forget that the blowing of the trumpets was not the battle itself. It wasn't just about blowing the trumpets. I don't want to, us to envision and to think that there was just a bunch of musicians that were walking around with some trumpets playing a nice jazzy song and then that walls came down. I cannot say it enough. The, wall, the trumpet was for signal. But understand that uh, there were armed men. The Bible says uh, that in, in Joshua 6 and 7, and he said unto the people, pass on and come past the city. Go about the city and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. Uh, so uh, it's not just about the blowing of the trumpets. Uh, that's not the battle itself. The blowing of the trumpets and the shouting and following the instructions of God. The only thing that did was let the walls fall down. There still has to be armed men that will endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There still has to be people that are prepared to fight and to battle. Uh, can I get somebody to praise God with me in this place? Now, as we move on, the Bible says, or rather, not only were there armed men that went before the ark, there was a rear guard as well. Joshua 6 and 9 says, and the armed men went before the priest that blew with the trumpets, and the re-reward came after the ark, the priest going on and blowing with the trumpet. 
Everybody had their place. There was a position. If there was going to be ultimate victory, and if we want to look at being victorious, the book of Joshua was the perfect place to look at. One battle that we'll get into in the weeks to come very, very shortly, one battle that they lost because they did not do what they were instructed to do. Other than this, this was uh, uh, pretty near, as the southerners would say, this was pretty near a perfect army. Um that had a uh, almost perfect victory because they because they had faith and because they followed the instructions of the Lord. Just like I, just like we learned from Joshua one and eight um, that meditate on the word day and night. Then shalt thou have good success. Then shalt thou make thy way prosperous. Whichever way you go, that's the way that will be made prosperous. Glory to God. So now. Uh, as we move on, it says, And the army went before the priests to blew the trumpets, and the reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. The, the, the aforementioned, talking about the, the, all of this that I just mentioned to you, it indicates military strategy, strategy rather, not just blind faith. Let me, be, let me assure you that faith is a must. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently, diligently seek him. When you diligently seek God, he will reward you. Jumping ahead a little bit, when they did lose that battle uh, uh, at Ai, Joshua began to seek God. The leaders began to seek God. They put dust on their head. They mourned and they were seeking God. And God answered Joshua when he saw him and led him back into victory and instructed him to what was wrong and what he needed to do to fix it. So it's, and I'll deal more with that later, but it's important for us to show it's not just by blind faith. We understand that we walk not by sight, but that we walk by faith. But uh, let's get a lesson from Brother James. The Bible says in James 2 and 18 through 20, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith. They had to have faith. Joshua was a man of faith. Caleb was a man of faith. They were men of faith when nobody else believed, they believed. And I'm telling you, that's what it's like in the end times that we're living in today. There's got to be somebody that has another spirit in them. That's like a Joshua and a Caleb that believes when nobody else believes. When there's, when there's 12 total people and 10 of them are saying, no, 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 we cannot do it. But two people are believing, yes, we can do it. Yes, we will come out of this COVID-19 pandemic unscathed, unharmed. Harmed. Our finances will not be harmed. The people of God will be safe. The people of God will be, uh, number one, they won't be affected by it. And number two, if they happen to be diagnosed with it, they, 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 they won't have any symptoms. And number two, if they do have symptoms, they will be healed by the power of God. That's what, the, that's what Joshua and Caleb's faith is like. Believing God when nobody else believes God. Amen. And not only that, refuting the evil report and and that is what it is the job of us to do in this hour. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Now, as we move on in here, the Bible uh, goes on to say, uh, or rather, uh, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. He says, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Book of Joshua is a faith book. Thou believest that there is one God. You do well. But guess what? The devils also believe and they tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? What I'm saying to you is it was not just enough for them to blow the trumpets. It was not just enough for the walls to fall down. It's not like when the walls came down that all of a sudden everybody, amen, just fell out and was dead. No, that was not the case. Amen. Glory to God. When the wall fell down. The Bible says they went every man, amen, with the edge of the sword. And I'm going to read uh, some of that uh, here in a minute. Amen. Glory to God. Now, what the Bible goes on to say in James 2 and 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now watch this. Uh, Jude 1 and 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you 
that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. In other words, there must be a fight. In the hour we're living in, there has to be a fight. The people of God must understand that we must continue to fight for what we believe. Joshua and Caleb fought in, in the book of Numbers in chapter number uh, uh, in chapter 14. They fought for what they believed. They fought for the promises of God. They fought for what God said. They understood that Numbers in 23 and 19 was right. They said God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? I wonder if there's a people of God in the house today that are willing to earnestly, not just contend, but earnestly to contend for the faith. Here in the book of Joshua in chapter number six, these people were given a promise of, and they didn't just say, see, that's the problem. Sometimes we can allow the Holy Ghost to make us be lazy in the spirit. Amen. And just, I understand that we need to pray, but we need to also get up and do a work in God. Isn't any good of me doing any good if I'm talking about let me pray for my neighbor that he be saved. Somebody's going to have to battle and, and go and speak to my neighbor and tell them about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Somebody's going to have to get on the trumpet and walk around the wall of my neighborhood and the wall of my community and the wall of my job and cry loud and spare not. Uh, amen. And lift up my voice like a trumpet. Uh, somebody's going to have to earnestly contend for the faith. Oh, glory be to the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So now, uh, as we go on, now listen, it was the power of God and the obedience of the people by their faith that made the walls come down. But after the wall came down, the people still had to take the city. And they did not do it with a song. They didn't do it with a dance. They didn't do it with just a shout. The shout made the walls come down. But after they shouted, it was time to get to work. Uh, amen. We need to understand whether it's an in, whether it's a live stream service, or whether it's an in-person service, whether it's a drive-in service. When we come to the house of God to get our feel and when we do our shout, now it's time to go out in battle. Amen. Glory to your name, Jesus. So, uh, so the Bible says in, in Joshua 6 and 20, so the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. They were armed. The walls came down. They went into the city, every man uh, with his sword. Uh, and they utterly, the Bible says, they utterly destroyed the city. Anything that was tainted, anything uh, other than what God had allowed for them to protect, which was Rahab, other than that, everything was utterly destroyed. Amen. Uh, there was action that was taken on their part. Glory be to the name of God. So now uh, as we deal with that, uh, it says that, now I want to talk about this for a moment in verse 21. It says they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. And we'll be dealing with this some, especially a lot in the book of Joshua. And I know it may seem like it's, it's, it's a broken record, uh, but I think it's important. And that is they utterly destroyed. Now what they did here initially, they started out well, okay? They utterly destroyed uh, the city. They did what they were supposed to do. They didn't save ox. They didn't save man. They didn't save woman. Uh, they didn't save young. They didn't save old. They utterly destroyed the city. And so what I'm saying to all of us is that it is imperative in this hour that we utterly destroy the city. In other words, when it comes to 
our relationship with God, when it comes to uh, things that we are battling, things that are not of God, uh, uh, Hezekiah and different ones in the Bible, they tore down the high places. Remember now, one of the, the, the biggest thing that God had a problem with from the beginning of time with man was idolatry. And he's still having a problem with idolatry. So what, what do you mean when you say, uh, Brother Pastor, that uh, to utterly destroy the city? Anything that is not God in my life, I must utterly break down. Anything that comes from my mouth that is not God, I must utterly break down. Anything, I'm, I mean, I must utterly destroy it. Anything that comes from my attitude, from my actions, from my intentions, I must utterly, what do you mean by utterly? Completely. Leave no stone unturned. Take no prisoner. Tear it down. Because we cannot be what God wants us to be if we do not utterly destroy it. And if we allow snares and things to be in our lives, what do you mean? When we allow negative thoughts to come in that are not God, the Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So as we think, and so what do you mean? The Bible says evil communication. That is what corrupts good manners. So when we get around other folks, when we allow things to come into our lives, what destroyed Solomon? He didn't utterly destroy stuff. What destroyed Solomon? He mixed and mingled and married things that he ought not have been mixing and mingling with. And so we cannot take the city. We cannot be the real children of God that God desires for us to be. And one of the things that I want you to understand that the book of Joshua is exemplified and talks about uh, uh, significantly is a new generation. I've told you before that the, the number 40, one of the things that the number 40 represents is it is symbolic of a generation. For 40 years, they wandered until an entire generation died. That one means that when we come forth, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That means if the old generation is dead, notice that, that the, the generation of Joshua did nothing. They did nothing like the generation of Moses did. They weren't circumcised in the wilderness. In other words, they didn't cut off the flesh. There were things that they did not do that the, that the generation of Joshua did do. So what we must understand is that old generation is dead. The old mentality of how we thought and used to think or whatever, that has got to be gone. That has to die if we're going to take and have total possession. And as perfect as the army, well, it wasn't perfect, but as good as Joshua's army was, amen, it still had fault, amen. And when we find one of the reasons that it had fault was because somebody still lusted. Uh, somebody still wanted to take of the accursed thing. Uh, somebody, and, and what was that? That was a selfish person. Okay, we cannot as a body, we're many members, but we are one body. I showed to you earlier, the priest had a job, the rear guard had a job, the, the, the armed men had a job, Joshua had a job. Is anybody talking to me in the house today? Amen, glory to God. Everybody had a position and everybody must and everybody had to execute their position. To the T that God had instructed for them to do. So if the church is going to rise up in the hour and be that what God wants it to be, it has to stand in the position that God has created for it to do. Oh, I wish I had somebody to talk with me in this place today. And so that's the issue at times. We don't stay in our positions and do what God is desiring for us to do and we do not utterly, utterly cast or rather destroy those things that God is telling us to destroy. Amen. It's not the will of God for us to be around everybody. It's not the will of God for us to fellowship with everybody. Come on, somebody. I wish somebody would help me up in this house today. Amen. But I know it's right anyhow. Uh, and so we just need to understand uh, that they utterly destroyed 
all that was in the city. I wonder if somebody could just where you are shout out all. They, un they utterly destroyed everything that was in the city. Everything that was in this wicked city, they rooted out. The Bible talks about in Jeremiah, uh, one who, who, whose voice was like a trumpet. The Bible talks about the book of Jeremiah in chapter number 1, uh, verses 7 through 10. That, he, that, that Jeremiah was there to root out, to, to, to plant, to build, to destroy. Uh, this word that we have, the Bible says it's a, that the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Uh, and and, and, and uh, uh, is it a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart? What are you saying? We have a sword. They were armed. What is it? What, was, what must we do? We must be armed. I'm getting ready to close. But we must be armed. And what are we armed with? We are armed with the word of God. I'm telling you right now, we are in a book of Joshua era. We're in a book of Joshua time period. We are walking around the wall. And that trump, the last trump, is going to sound. Amen. And we must be ready to meet him. But that last trump, and those, but those walls aren't coming down until that last trump sound. So we must, what are we, and well, we got to be ready. We got to be prepared to have this sword and to battle. Every single, single one of us must battle. Every, and we have to understand that the battle, uh, it belongs to the Lord, but we also must understand that the weapons of our warfare are what? 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. The weapons of our war warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. What does it mean? I close prayerfully with this. What does it mean when we say carnal? Carnal are things pertaining to the flesh. Carnal are things that are pertaining uh, to the five senses. We don't operate in the five senses. We don't operate or move uh, based upon what we feel. Mm, we don't operate or move based upon what, uh, what, what, we, what we see. Because we walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. So when we go away from the carnal into the spiritual, what we operate by is the will of God and the instructions of God. God instructed. And we'll wrap up chapter number six uh, next week, move into chapter number seven uh, and deal with some other things here. But understand that uh, they were successful by several things. One, they had a leader who was unwavering. Can I say that enough? They had a leader in Joshua who had sat under great tutelage, who loved God, who spent time with God. I don't care who you are, uh, not just Greater Emmanuel, but everybody that's listening to me. In this hour, you better sit under a leader who's unwavering. Not saying they won't make a mistake, but that's unwavering. You better sit under a leader that, uh, uh, that spends time with God. You better sit under a leader who no matter what the world is doing and no, matter, and no matter what the world is saying, amen, you best sit under a leader who's going to walk with God, who's going to meditate on the word day and night. And not only that, we better be meditating on the word day and night. We better understand where our strength comes from. We better understand what our weapon is and what our power is. I don't have to fight people uh, through on Facebook. I don't have to fight people uh, uh, through different things. I'm fighting people through the word of God. And so when they fell on every man with the edge of the sword, that's a natural example. That's a natural, hey baby, that's a natural example. Of, of what we need to do in the spiritual. We are spiritually. We have our sword. Spiritually we win the war. Uh, and it's not that we're killing people with the sword. We're killing flesh with the sword. We're making people's flesh die. So that they would be born again. We saw one that was baptized in Jesus name. In the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to baptize people. We're going to lay hands on the sick. And they shall. Recover. <laughs> Amen. And I know that I'm right about it. Now, uh, so as I close my Bible, that'll give you hope. You don't have a drive home, uh, so you don't have to worry about it over a few minutes. But 
I want to go back as I close with this. I want to go back to what I was talking about on Sunday. Let us go on. There was a different level. There was a level of maturity in the people that sat under the leadership of Joshua. That they that there was not of those that sat under the leadership of Moses. And Moses was a great leader. Sometimes leaders, you can do all you can do and the people are going to be the people. But you still have a responsibility. I hope I'm talking to somebody in the house today. Sometimes you can do everything you know how to do. But people are still going to be people. Keep on leading. Keep on preaching. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking God. But most of all, I hope that I encourage each and every one of you to go on. Go on in the Lord. Get mature in God. Go to another level. Increase your prayer life. Increase your word life. Because if you don't, the Bible says that in the end times, that the righteous will scarcely make it. The righteous. He said that he had to shorten. Shorten those days for the elect's sake. Oh, I wish somebody would help me in this house today. Amen. Glory to God. Anyhow. We love you, praying for you, asking you to stay uh, tuned, asking you to continue to keep the uh, Greater Emmanuel, specifically all of leadership, but especially uh, our Greater Emmanuel leadership in prayer. Lots of decisions that need to be made. Uh, lots of decisions uh, as far as when we need to, get, uh, when we're going to be getting back into service, and whether or not we're going to be uh, potentially doing some drive-in services. We're still praying about things, and we're asking you to pray with us. Excuse me and pray for us. We want people to be saved in the sound. We want people to receive the word of God. We want you to continue to host the, these watch parties. Uh, you know, we don't want you to live in fear. We want you to utterly stamp out. And so it is my prayer this week. And I'm going to do the same thing as you fast. Uh, maybe another day this week. Uh, it is my prayer that you would utterly destroy everything in your life that is not God. That you walk in the will of God. Amen. We're going to pray right now. Amen. Glory to God. Ask the Lord to have his way. Ask you to tune in with us on Friday. On our conference prayer line. Our conference call. Um, uh, you've got those numbers. We'll get those to you. Uh, stay tuned to all of our social media sites. And our website. Uh, for more information. Uh, now Father. Uh, we give you glory. We give you honor and praise. We thank you for the word today. We thank you for all that you are doing and have done in our lives. There is nobody like you, God. Nobody, Father, that is worthy of praise. Nobody, God, that is worthy of glory and of honor, Lord Jesus Christ, like you. Lord, we ask you to just help us to continue to live this word. Live uh, this book, Lord God, as you will and as you desire for us to live, oh God, we do tonight. Uh, give you glory, honor, and praise, and ask you to continually be in our lives. We glorify you, God. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify your name, and, and we love you in this house today, oh, heavenly God. Continue to go with us and be with us, oh, heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Thank God. Now, I want those you can say in your home that you're with me. You can comment on the screen, however you want to do it. But say, now let the words of my mouth. And the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you until we do see you again. Amen. May heaven smile upon you. More grace in Jesus' name. Amen.